This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Kara Schallenberg. History of the United States by Charles A. Beard and Mary Ritter Beard. Part 1. Chapter 2. The Colonial Peoples. The English. In leadership and origin, the thirteen colonies, excepting New York and Delaware, were English. During the early days of all, save these two, the main, if not the sole, current of immigration was from England. The colonists came from every walk of life. They were men, women, and children of all sorts and conditions. The major portion were yeomen, or small landowners, farm labourers, and artisans. With them were merchants, and gentlemen who brought their stocks of goods or their fortunes to the new world. Scholars came from Oxford and Cambridge to preach the gospel or to teach. Now and then the son of an English nobleman left his baronial hall behind and cast his lot with America. The people represented every religious faith. Members of the established Church of England, Puritans who had laboured to reform that church, Separatists, Baptists, and friends who had left it altogether, and Catholics, who clung to the religion of their fathers. New England was almost purely English. During the years between 1629 and 1640, the period of arbitrary Stuart government, about 20,000 Puritans immigrated to America, settling in the colonies of the far north. Although minor additions were made from time to time, the greater portion of the New England people sprang from this original stock. Virginia, too, for a long time, drew nearly all her immigrants from England alone. Not until the eve of the Revolution did other nationalities, mainly the Scotch-Irish and Germans, rival the English in numbers. The populations of later English colonies, the Carolinas, New York, Pennsylvania, and Georgia, while receiving a steady stream of immigration from England, were constantly augmented by wanderers from the older settlements. New York was invaded by Puritans from New England in such numbers as to cause the Anglican clergymen there to lament that free thinking spreads almost as fast as the church. North Carolina was first settled toward the northern border by immigrants from Virginia. Some of the North Carolinians, particularly the Quakers, came all the way from New England, tarrying in Virginia only long enough to learn how little they were wanted in that Anglican colony. THE SCOTCH-IRISH Next to the English in numbers and influence were the Scotch-Irish, Presbyterians in belief, English in tongue. Both religious and economic reasons sent them across the sea. Their Scotch ancestors, in the days of Cromwell, had settled in the north of Ireland whence the native Irish had been driven by the conqueror's sword. There the Scotch flourished for many years, enjoying in peace their own form of religion and growing prosperous in the manufacture of fine linen and woolen cloth. Then the blow fell. Toward the end of the seventeenth century their religious worship was put under the ban, and the export of their cloth was forbidden by the English Parliament. Within two decades twenty thousand Scotch-Irish left Ulster alone for America, and all during the eighteenth century the migration continued to be heavy. Although no exact record was kept, it is reckoned that the Scotch-Irish and the Scotch who came directly from Scotland composed one-sixth of the entire American population on the eve of the Revolution. These newcomers in America made their homes chiefly in New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Maryland, Virginia, and the Carolinas. Coming late upon the scene, they found much of the land immediately upon the seaboard already taken up. For this reason most of them became frontier people settling the interior and upland regions. There they cleared the land, laid out their small farms, and worked as sturdy yeomen on the soil, hardy, industrious, and independent in spirit, sharing neither the luxuries of the rich planters, nor the easy life of the leisurely merchants. To their agriculture they added woolen and linen manufactures, which, flourishing in the supple fingers of their tireless women, 
made heavy inroads upon the trade of the English merchants in the colonies. Of their labours a poet has sung, O willing hands to toil, strong natures tuned to the harvest song and bound to the kindly soil, bold pioneers for the wilderness, defenders in the field. THE GERMANS Third among the colonists, in order of numerical importance, were the Germans. From the very beginning they appeared in colonial records. A number of the artisans and carpenters in the first Jamestown colony were of German descent. Peter Minuit, the famous governor of New Motherland, was a German from Wesel on the Rhine, and Jacob Leisler, leader of a popular uprising against the provincial administration of New York, was a German from Frankfurt on Main. The wholesale migration of Germans began with the founding of Pennsylvania. Penn was diligent in searching for thrifty farmers to cultivate his lands, and he made a special effort to attract peasants from the Rhine country. A great association, known as the Frankfurt Company, bought more than twenty thousand acres from him, and in 1684 established a centre at Germantown for the distribution of German immigrants. In old New York, Rhinebeck on the Hudson became a similar centre for distribution. All the way from Maine to Georgia, inducements were offered to the German farmers, and in nearly every colony were to be found, in time, German settlements. In fact, the migration became so large that German princes were frightened at the loss of so many subjects, and England was alarmed by the influx of foreigners into her overseas dominions. Yet nothing could stop the movement. By the end of the colonial period, the number of Germans had risen to more than two hundred thousand. The majority of them were Protestants from the Rhine region and South Germany. Wars, religious controversies, oppression, and poverty drove them forth to America. Though most of them were farmers, there were also among them skilled artisans who contributed to the rapid growth of industries in Pennsylvania. Their iron, glass, paper, and woolen mills, dotted here and there among the thickly settled regions, added to the wealth and independence of the province. Unlike the Scotch-Irish, the Germans did not speak the language of the original colonists, or mingle freely with them. They kept to themselves, built their own schools, founded their own newspapers, and published their own books. Their clannish habits often irritated their neighbours, and led to occasional agitations against foreigners. However, no serious collisions seem to have occurred, and in the days of the Revolution, German soldiers from Pennsylvania fought in the Patriot armies side by side with soldiers from the English and Scotch-Irish sections. OTHER NATIONALITIES Though the English, the Scotch-Irish, and the Germans made up the bulk of the colonial population, there were other racial strains as well, varying in numerical importance, but contributing their share to colonial life. From France came the Huguenots, fleeing from the decree of the king which inflicted terrible penalties upon Protestants. From Old Ireland came thousands of native Irish, Celtic in race and Catholic in religion. Like their Scotch-Irish neighbours to the north, they revered neither the government nor the Church of England imposed upon them by the sword. How many came we do not know, but shipping records of the colonial period show that boatload after boatload left the southern and eastern shores of Ireland for the New World. Undoubtedly thousands of their passengers were Irish of the native stock. This surmise is well sustained by the constant appearance of Celtic names in the records of various colonies. The Jews, then as ever engaged in their age-long battle for religious and economic toleration, found in the American colonies not complete liberty, but certainly more freedom than they enjoyed in England, France, Spain, or Portugal. The English law did not actually recognize their right to live in any of the dominions, but owing to the easy-going habits of the Americans, they were allowed to filter into the seaboard towns. The treatment they received there varied. On one occasion the mayor and council of New York forbade them to sell by retail, and on another prohibited the exercise of their religious worship. 
Newport, Philadelphia, and Charleston were more hospitable, and there large Jewish colonies, consisting principally of merchants and their families, flourished in spite of nominal prohibitions of the law. Though the small Swedish colony in Delaware was quickly submerged beneath the tide of English migration, the Dutch in New York continued to hold their own for more than a hundred years after the English conquest of 1664. At the end of the colonial period over one half of the 170,000 inhabitants of the province were descendants of the original Dutch, still distinct enough to give a decided cast to the life and manners of New York. Many of them clung as tenaciously to their mother tongue as they did to their capacious farmhouses or their Dutch ovens, but they were slowly losing their identity as the English pressed in beside them to farm and trade. The melting pot had begun its historic mission. End of chapter 2 Read by Kara Schallenberg on May 11, 2007 in Oceanside, California.